service here this morning at the Tron Church. We'll begin in just a few moments, but uh, as the musicians play quietly now, let's join in preparing ourselves, quieting our hearts, and focusing our minds so that we're ready to call on the Lord and hear His Word. of Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the known world some two and a half thousand years ago. Praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. We're going to begin this morning by singing number 248 in our blue hymn books. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most holy, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, your great name we praise. Number 248.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. We bow in your presence, O God, immortal, invisible, the only wise and true, the only living God, who is hidden from our eyes in the true splendor of your glory. And yet, you are, Lord, manifest all around us in everything that you've made, in everything that you've done, in the creation and in the sustaining of this vast universe around about us, whose very majesty declares to us your majesty day after day, night after night. But above all, Lord, your glory has been made known so marvelously in the great story of your redemption, in the salvation of your people, in the story that comes to its triumphant zenith in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great work for us and for our salvation. And so, of course, it is in his name that we gather this morning. It's before his name that we bow and draw near to the true majesty of your glory. And as we find that glory in him, it is a glory suffused with your mercy, with your grace, even towards us in all our weakness, in all our sinfulness, a glory that draws near us to bless us, even as we humble ourselves, even as we bow before you in worship with penitent hearts. But Lord, you must humble us. You must break the hardness of these hearts of ours that are so constantly wayward, so constantly being hardened against you. Help us, Lord, so that we would not be proud, we would not be those who, who try to cloak our sinfulness before your face, but rather be people who do confess with humble hearts, with lowly, with penitent hearts, all of our sins before you so that we may find forgiveness by your infinite goodness and mercy, so that we should not perish, but should know the blessed assurance of life, life eternal, life in your presence forever and ever. So hear us, Lord, we pray, humble us afresh by your Holy Spirit powerfully at work within us. Now, today, this very hour, as we gather together in your name, work in us, Lord, your transforming, forgiving grace to make us live for the glory of Christ our King, the only King of all worlds, of all ages, that we might live to glorify him now and always until his great coming and then forever in his glorious presence, in the abundant joy of our Father's house. So hear us, Lord, help us. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our great Savior. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed uh, to all of you this morning very particularly if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time here with us at uh, one of our gatherings of the Tron Church, then you're very particularly welcome indeed. You, you should have had these uh, sheets, I think, on your seats or uh, given to you on the way in. Let me just uh, mention one or two things. On the front there, you'll see all our services today. Do come back and join us this evening at 6.30. We begin a new little series on the exciting story of the, the raiding of the Ark of God in uh, the story of First Samuel. So come and join us then. We also have the Farsi service this evening downstairs and uh, time after those meetings to mingle and to 
encourage one another in the different congregations. Inside, you'll see various things for the life of the church this coming week. Do read those and take note of them. I won't go through them all, but let me remind you, um, on Tuesday, it's the second week, just the second week of our uh, new Christianity Explored course. So that means it's not too late to come along or to bring a friend along uh, to study Mark's gospel together. It's a seven-week course. It follows on ideally, really, from the Mark drama where we uh, saw the whole of Mark's gospel portrayed uh, over the Easter weekend or indeed the Easter services themselves. Uh, It's uh, an informal chance to read the gospel, to ask all the questions that you might have, your friends might have, uh, about uh, the truth that is in Jesus, who he is, what he said, and so on. So not too late to come. Uh, Do uh, feel free to come along uh, for 7.30 on Tuesday here, and uh, you'll be very welcome indeed. The see small groups are on this Wednesday. Again, if you want to know more about that, please ask somebody after the services. We're keen for people to be involved in small groups. There are various ones around the city, but also quite a number that meet here uh, centrally for convenience. So uh, do take note of that. Friday and Saturday, Friday evening and Saturday morning, we're uh, we're running again a a parenting course that we ran very successfully uh, a little while ago. Uh, I think Paul is yet to hear back from some of those whom he uh, invited about that. So please, could you do that? Speak to him. If you don't know about it, if you haven't heard about it, but you'd like to come along, uh, then there is still time to book in for that as well. Just speak to Paul this morning uh, or one of us after the service, and uh, we'd be glad to do that. A very useful and practical, uh, sane and biblical course uh, helping us to uh, know how to live as families and to bring up our children. So uh, do take note of that. On the back page there, you'll see a couple of things, uh, very encouraging news about our Easter offering. Well done to everybody for uh, taking part in that. Uh, And also, ladies, just a note in your diary, the 12th of uh, May for uh, a women's breakfast, so do uh, take note of that. Well, we're going to turn to our Bibles now, to our reading this morning, which you'll find in Daniel chapter 5. If you have one of the uh, Blue Visitors Bibles, it's page 742. And uh, Paul began last week a very short series in the central chapters of Daniel in three of these great kings uh, that ruled the world in those days. Nebuchadnezzar, and then his, uh, well, his grandson, his successor, Belshazzar, and then King Darius. So last week you looked at chapter 4, which ends with the uh, great humbling and then the restoration of King Nebuchadnezzar, who came to know and understand the true and living God and proclaimed those extraordinary words in the last verse of chapter 4. But here in chapter 5, we have a very different story indeed. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of a thousand. Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. And they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed. His thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way. His knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, perhaps the queen mother, as the footnote says, Because of the words of the king and his lords came into the banqueting hall. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. 
Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of all the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered him and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing, to make known to me its interpretation. But they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I've heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples and nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you and your lords and your wives and your concubines and they have drunk wine from them and you've praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Amen. May God bless to us his word. We're going to sing now number 90 in our blue books, which is a version of Psalm 90, the Psalm of Moses, that reminds us of the sovereignty of God and of the frailness and the brevity, even of the greatest of men, in his hand. O Lord our God, in every age, 
our home upon the earth. Number 90. Well, our offerings for the Lord's work are received now. That's the offerings received and the musicians play. Perhaps you'd like to open your Bibles and read again this dramatic story we'll be studying together shortly. Uh, but in any case, in the quiet, our offerings are now received. <laughs>
Let's pray together. Turn back, O oh man, at your decree we all return to dust. For swifter than a day, you see a thousand years race past. You sweep us, everyone, away. We vanish from the light as grass springs up and flowers by day, yet droops and dies by night. Our Father, as we bow before you, as we contemplate these words of Scripture, our hearts are humble before you. And yet, Lord, we are comforted in the knowledge of your sovereign power, of your sovereign presence in this world and over this world. A world filled with rulers strutting their place upon the stage, showing forth their power, their influence, their might. In Syria, in Russia, in North Korea, in China, in America, in Europe. Great men with great power and great influence over vast millions, billions even of people with guns and ships and tanks and rockets and gold and currency reserves and political sway and influence. Some over many other rulers and kings, others in their own little fiefdoms, and yet all, all raised up only at your permission and removed by the breath of your mouth. What a comfort to us, Lord, as we read the newspapers, as we fret so often at the state of world affairs, at its uncertainties, the vicissitudes of life, the appalling acts that we see and hear about from despots and dictators and the fearful decisions that have to be made by other rulers seeking to bear the responsibility to preserve peace, to bring justice, to prevent war. It's so hard for us, Lord, to know enough to pray with accuracy, to ask for things with great confidence in particular situations and for particular needs. But we thank you that although there are so many things that we are ignorant of, there is one great truth that you have made us cognizant of, and that is that you are the God of heaven, you are the most high God, and that in your hands alone, ultimately, all the issues of our lives, all the issues of this world truly belong. And so we pray, Lord, that the rulers of this world, great and small, likewise, would turn their eyes to the wisdom of heaven. Like these kings we've read of, would seek the words, the interpretation, the understanding of events in this life and in their lives and in the world. The interpretation that comes with clarity, with truth, with certainty. Only from the pages of your revealed word, which teach us the true story of life, the true story of this whole universe, which is your story, the story of the coming, the saving, the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, even as we are often fearful of the world around us, we thank you for the joy that does fill our hearts of the knowledge that we live to share in the glory of your coming kingdom. And that we work in all our lives, whatever it is that we're called to do, we work in partnership with every one of your people throughout this globe who likewise labor, not in vain, but for that which is eternal, the glory, the peace, the joy of the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Lord, very especially this morning for the many partners we have around the world some from our own congregation here serving in 
Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South America, in other places, at one with us in fellowship in Christ, at one in the same task of making the Lord Jesus Christ known, translating the scriptures into other tongues, starting churches, healing bodies, while at the same time proclaiming the name of the one who is the ultimate healer, the Lord Jesus, who came to heal the sick from sin and from death. We thank you, Lord, that all over this world today there are people just like us gathering in places like this, some inside, some outside, some large and some small, but bowing in your name, offering prayers to your throne, joining with us in the words that actually move and change and shake this earth, words of prayers and requests brought to you, the sovereign, the most high God. So Lord, as we gather this morning here in our place, we pray that you would likewise lift up our eyes and the eyes of our hearts to see above the maelstrom of human history and politics and pretensions to see the heavens opened, to see the one who sits enthroned forever, at whose word every ruler on this earth will at last be judged. And give us confidence, we pray, to be those who speak his name, who proclaim his word, who announce his coming, and who offer his peace for those who will truly humble themselves before him before it is too late. Give us confidence and give us, we pray, humility in our own hearts to hear and to heed your great and gracious words. So hear us. Draw near to us, we pray. For all that we ask is in the name of your Son and our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word, we sing the hymn on the screens. Now, in reverence and awe, we gather round the word of our God. <laughs>
good morning. Please do uh, turn back to Daniel chapter 5, which we read a little earlier. Daniel chapter 5. There's an old hymn by Joseph Alexander that begins with these words. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. Chapters 4 and 5 of Daniel illustrate that hidden boundary in glorious technicolor, don't they? Daniel chapter 5, as we saw last week, showed us the wonderful kindness and patience of the Lord toward King Nebuchadnezzar. Things did work out for him in the end. But Daniel chapter 5 is a very different story. Sometimes things don't end well. Sometimes it is too late. And it was too late for King Belshazzar, who experienced God's wrath. It is a sobering chapter, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. Sobering in content, but also sobering in the speed at which the events unfold. I want you to imagine a series of images, images that show a before and after. You know the sort of thing. You'll get them on TV after a natural disaster showing a city before and after the earthquake or the tsunami has struck. Well, imagine a series of photos showing the city of Babylon. So here's the first couple of photos. The first photo is set before you, and it shows you the wide-angle shot of Babylon, full of life and celebration, the streets bustling with people going about their day-to-day business. You can see the glow of fires in people's homes. Well, the second image shows the very same scene, but this time the streets are empty. The fires are out. The Mede and Persian occupation forces now patrol the streets, enforcing the curfew. Here's another couple of photos, and this time it shows the royal palace. The first shows the palace rowdy with thousands of the lords The kings and uh, the the banqueting enjoying plentiful wine. The wives and concubines are there. The place is jumping. But the second photo shows the very same scene. But this time, the place is empty. Glasses of wine lie smashed on the floor. Food has been dropped all over the palace as people flared. And the last couple of photos, they focus in on just one man. The first photo shows King Belshazzar in full party mode, golden goblet in one hand, full to the brim with wine, a concubine on the other arm, and his crown firmly fixed upon his head. The second photo, well, it shows King Belshazzar lying dead, blood flowing from his side, the golden goblet now empty, the concubine gone, and the crown removed from his head. The picture of Babylon in verse 1 is completely different to the Babylon of verse 31, isn't it? This is about as a dramatic a fall from grace as you can imagine. And it is the fulfillment of the very words that chapter 4 ended with. Look there again, which Willie read earlier, chapter 4, verse 37. Those who walk in pride... God is able to humble. You couldn't have a more vivid illustration of that truth uttered by the king Nebuchadnezzar than these events of chapter 5 of Daniel. The decline and fall of a once great nation is staggering. It begins, verse 1, with Babylon and the throes of a great banquet, feasting and celebration and revelry. And yet within a few hours, the Babylonian empire was no longer. The king is dead. The empire in the hands of another king, Darius the Mede. And what is abundantly clear is that even the most impressive of human institutions, even the most powerful of empires, is transitory. Even the great Babylon is temporary 
even it exists at the pleasure of the true king, the Lord God of heaven. Now, it's essential that as we begin to remember that this account is not here to give us a comprehensive account of the Babylonian Empire. This is not a history of Babylon, but rather, as one writer put it, it is a, a tract for nourishing Israelite faith. This was written to Israelites. It was written for a purpose, to give them great strength, to strengthen them in their faith, strengthen their faith in the Lord God of heaven during their early years in the return from exile, to remind them that their God was sovereign, that he was in control, and that those who walk in pride, the Belshazzars of this world, he is able to humble. So we'll look at it in two, two sections. First, verses 1 to 9. A king, utterly defiant, is brought to his knees by God. And we see in these first nine verses the arrogance of prideful man and total disdain for the God of heaven. But we also see how quickly man's pride is brought crashing down. We're introduced there in verse 1 to King Belshazzar. Now, some time has passed since the end of chapter 4. Just over 20 years have passed since chapter 4, verse 37. And Belshazzar is, in fact, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. There's been one or two other kings in between. None have lasted all that long. But Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And he's a man who does not seem to have learned the lessons his grandfather learned. His grandfather, who learned, as we saw last week, the hard way to humble himself before the Lord God. This king, Belshazzar, is instead totally defiant towards the Lord God. Look at what he does here in these opening verses. He throws a lavish party. Now, fair enough, you might think, kings do that sort of thing. But once the party's underway, a thought strikes him. He commands that the sacred vessels of gold and silver that his grandfather had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, he commands that they be brought into the party. And they're brought out. And verse 4, they're enjoying it, they're drinking wine from him, and they praise not the Lord God of heaven, whose temple these vessels come from, but rather they praise the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Belshazzar's attitude toward God is one of utter defiance and contempt, isn't it? And as Dale Ralph Davis puts it, contempt for God's stuff, well, it equals contempt for God himself. And that is a true observation, isn't it? Just think about the way in which you treat the belongings of others. That does indicate your real attitude towards them. So, for example, if you borrow somebody's car and you return it with the fuel empty, the car dirty, and rubbish lying all over the place, then you're not just showing contempt towards the car, are you? You're showing contempt toward the owner of the car, the person you borrowed it from. And likewise, in a far more serious way, Belshazzar's total scorn towards these items from the temple, it indicates his real scorn towards the Lord God of heaven, whose items they were. Later on in the passage, Daniel describes the attitude there in verse 23. He says that Belshazzar here lifted himself up against the Lord God of heaven in what he does here. He knew what he was doing. He knew exactly where these items came from. And so he didn't sin in ignorance, but rather in full knowledge of what he was doing. This was flagrant and public defiance of God. Notice there in verse 1, he's doing this in front of the thousand. All eyes were on him as he called for the vessels from Jerusalem to be brought out. He brazenly and publicly mocks the living God. But God will not be mocked. And we see in an instant, Belshazzar is brought to his knees. God would not be mocked then. And he will not be mocked today. Those who defy him need to take note of all that happens in the rest of the chapter. A day will come, perhaps soon, perhaps way down the line, but it will come. A day of reckoning 
when all those who mock the living God, whatever form it takes, whether it's mocking his church, whether it's the mocking of Christians, whether it's the mocking of God's plans and purposes for his world, whatever it is, those who mock the Lord, well, their mocking will have to be accounted for. And for Belshazzar, that day had already come. Look on to verse 5. Immediately, immediately the fingers of a hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the king's wall. The king saw as the hand wrote. His color changed. His thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way. His knees knocked together. God brought the brazen and brash king Belshazzar to his knees and utter sobriety in an instant. You can just imagine the whole room, can't you? A whole room full of parting and feasting, suddenly falling absolutely silent. Everyone turns to look. The musicians stop playing. You can hear a pin drop. It doesn't take much for the pomp and pride of man to give way to fear and trembling, does it? And the Lord does that here in an instant. What is Belshazzar to do? A hand has appeared out of nowhere, scratched some words on the wall he cannot understand. What is he going to do? Well, his first port of call is the religious crowd, the usual suspects. They're familiar, aren't they? If you read through Daniel, we saw them last week. The usual suspects are dragged in, the enchanters, the astrologers, the wise men of Babylon. And he promised them the world. If you can tell me what this means. He promised them great riches, great power. But they're absolutely stumped. No one has an answer. And as we saw last week, again and again and again, the religious pagans of the day had no answer. Had Belshazzar not learned that? Had he not learned? Well, clearly not. And the king... Verse 9 is greatly alarmed. Nobody has the answer. He's looked, hasn't he, in the wrong place for the answers. And that's still very much the case today. When people hit a crisis, as they undoubtedly will at some point in their lives, where do they turn to for answers? Where do you turn? When crisis comes, who do you look to? What do you look to? The horoscopes? the latest self-help guru, the charismatic so-called Christian leader who promises you, who promises you healing and solutions to your worldly problems today. Is that where you turn to? Because those things may provide a temporary fix, but there's nothing really there. Nothing to give answers to the deepest, most profound questions that you and I will face. If we haven't faced them already, we will. So Belshazzar, he found no answers from the gurus of the day in his moment of crisis. And as a last resort, last resort, he turns to Daniel. So then our second point as we look at verses 10 to the end. Our second point, a king utterly desperate is brought the word of God again. But it's too late. We see here the desperation that's looked in all the wrong places for answers, turning only to the word of God at a last resort. But for him, it was too late. Look down there at verse 10. The queen mother, likely Nebuchadnezzar's wife, the queen mother comes to the rescue. She reminds Belshazzar of what he already knew, that there was a man in the kingdom who was known for being able to answer these sort of questions. These perplexing questions he'd done it time and again. And as a last resort, Daniel's brought in. And notice the writer was careful to record that Belshazzar clearly knew about this Daniel guy. Or, well, he should have, he, he ought to have done anyway. Daniel had been there all along. Notice the end of verse 11. The queen says that your father, Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief of the magicians, the astrologers, the enchanters. He was the senior guy in the nation under the king. You knew about him, Belshazzar. You knew he was the chief. Look on to verse 13. 
The king said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. What a totally dismissive attitude, isn't it? Total arrogance from Belshazzar. Oh, yes, you're one of those Jews, one of the exiles. I've heard about you. But clearly, under Belshazzar's rule, Daniel, the great Daniel, the Bible teacher, the one who had once been chief over many, well, he had been relegated, sidelined, put into early retirements. And only now, only now as a last resort as he turned to. And as we see, it really is too late for Belshazzar. He's failed to listen to Daniel, who's been there all along. How foolish. Belshazzar has demeaned Daniel's God. He's despised Daniel's status. But Daniel is the only one, the only one who can help him. And so now Daniel speaks. And it is a devastating assessment of Belshazzar. It's clear that he has failed to learn the lesson of his predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's failed to humble himself before the Lord God. And that is where Daniel begins, verse 18. He begins speaking about King Nebuchadnezzar. And he says that God gave him his kingdom. God gave him his greatness. All the nations feared Nebuchadnezzar because of all that God had given him. But, verse 20, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne. His glory was taken from him. Now, we saw that last week as we looked at chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar was driven from his throne. He was made to eat grass like a wild animal. Total humiliation. And God did that. God humbled him so that, verse 20, he would know that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over him who he will. That was the drumbeat of chapter 4, wasn't it? Until he knew that the most high rules. He had to learn that. And he learned it the hard way. All he had was from God, yet he grew proud. And so God humbled him. And as you see at the end there in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar responded rightly, didn't he? He acknowledged God for who he really was. He worshipped him. Daniel reminds Belshazzar of all this, all the history he knew. And then he comes with the killer blow, verse 22. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this but you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. Look on to the end of verse 23. The God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. You knew all this, says Daniel. He knew all that had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He knew it, and yet he remained prideful. So Belshazzar's problem was not ignorance, but rather it was insolence. In possession of abundant knowledge about the living God, he would only show him contempt. And by desecrating the temple vessels, he openly mocked Israel's God. And by singing praises to the dumb deities of Babylon, he refused to honor the God who gave him his very breath. It's a vivid illustration, isn't it, what the Apostle Paul writes about in Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Belshazzar is a vivid example that having the right information, it doesn't guarantee the right response. He knew it all. He knew it. But he refused to humble his heart. It's very sobering, isn't it? And it plays out in our own experience. On a national level, for many centuries, we've been so privileged here in Britain, haven't we, to have God's word taught and honored. It's formed the very basis of our constitution, a rich heritage. But as a nation, we've turned our backs on the word of God, his messengers. 
We've had the right information for centuries, but there's been widespread rejection. We see it on the personal level too. People exposed to good teaching over many years. They've perhaps grown up in a living church, but they reject it. They refuse to humble themselves before God. It's not information that's lacking. It's a very sobering reality. Some people will choose darkness over light, like Belshazzar. But here's the really sobering thing. Sometimes, sometimes for people like that, it is too late. Nebuchadnezzar was given the opportunity to repent. He was prideful. But God was patient, wasn't he? He humbled himself. He repented. And Belshazzar, too, has been given time to repent. He knew all that happened to his predecessor. But he's refused to humble himself. But for him, it was too late. It was too late. He had had a lifetime of opportunity. Just think of the shadow of God's abundant grace and mercy and kindness that would have stretched down through the years in that Babylonian throne room. The stories of Nebuchadnezzar, his personal testimony. He would have heard that. He knew it. The very presence of Daniel, the one who was unafraid to speak truth to power, always there. He'd been there all the time. Belshazzar had years of opportunity, but the opportunity wasn't taken, and now it was being withdrawn from him. It was too late. And then Daniel explains the words that are on the wall, verse 25. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance, found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. It's all over for Belshazzar. It's all over. Indeed, it's all over for the Babylonian Empire. Verse 30, that very night... It all comes to an end, just as the Lord said it would. You see, it is possible, it's possible to resist God's call of grace. It is possible to miss out on that opportunity to repent. Belshazzar had that opportunity. He had a lifetime to repent, but he refused. And ultimately, God honored that. To know that God is gracious, as Belshazzar undoubtedly did, we're told that, he knew it. To know God is gracious and yet turn, yet refuse to turn from sin in the light of that grace, well, that is to fall under God's righteous judgment. That was for him the sin from which there was no remedy or pardon. It wasn't so much the outward and blatant sins of Belshazzar that were the issue, but rather it was his continued and persistent impenitence, his refusal to receive mercy, his refusal to heed Daniel's testimony. That is what did it for for Belshazzar. As one preacher put it, the rioting and drunkenness in Belshazzar's life was only the shell, the outer expression of his rebellion against God. And such rebellion can take very different forms, even very respectable and religious forms. So don't be distracted by the nature of his sin, because there's an underlying problem. His refusal to repent and return to the Lord. His great sin was his persistent refusal to humble himself before God. That is the unforgivable sin. And so I wonder, is that you here this morning? Are you refusing to humble yourself? You've got the knowledge, you know the information. You just haven't humbled yourself. It's a sober warning. Do not dare presume upon the grace of God that he's shown to others. Don't think, don't presume that God will be as patient with you as he's been with somebody else you know. So don't wait to humble yourself before God. Don't wait. Don't put it off another moment. Sometimes it is too late. Don't presume God will deal with you like a Nebuchadnezzar. 
time and time and time again they had opportunity. Don't presume God will deal with you that way when he may well deal with you as a Belshazzar. See, those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. And he will humble. If not today, then one day. There is a day coming in history, an immovable day, when the Lord Jesus Christ will return and every knee will have to bow then. And he will then either call people to himself as those who have humbled themselves and they will reign with him in his everlasting kingdom or he will send people away as those he never knew. It's a sobering message, isn't it? But as we close, a couple of implications. One is an encouragement and the second a challenge. Here's the encouragement. No worldly power can thwart God's purposes. What we read about here is the demise of one of the great kingdoms, one of the great empires. The Babylonian Empire comes to a crashing end at the end of this chapter, and it comes to an end at the decree of the living God. So we ought to take comfort in that fact, take heart. Nothing is beyond the control of God. The things we see around us in our culture that perplex us, that concern us, the people in power, the empires of the day, they are not beyond his control. It's the opposite. They are totally under his control. So when individuals, even kings, oppose God and his people, God can convert them, advance his cause like he did with Nebuchadnezzar, or he can judge them and remove them as he did with Belshazzar. And that is a great comfort, isn't it? Our God reigns. He's on the throne. Now, we may not see that in our lifetime. But one day, there will be a great weighing in the balance. That day will come for all. And for Daniel, it did come in his lifetime. Captured by King Nebuchadnezzar, he lived to see the collapse of that very empire that captured him. Despite all its impressiveness and power, it was, after all, transitory temporary, tenuous. And that is a great encouragement, isn't it? But there's also a great challenge in this chapter. Two challenges, really. First, perhaps you have never actually humbled yourself before the living God. Perhaps, like Belshazzar, you've known much about God and his grace, but you've never actually responded in obedient trust. If that's you, here this morning, then you must. You must humble yourself before it's too late. Only God knows the number of days appointed for any life. No one knows their last day. No one knows their last promotion, their last journey. No one knows their last conversation, their last embrace of a loved one. No one knows their last sight of home. No one knows that. And no one living in defiance of God knows their last chance. Usually that day will be like any other day. The last opportunity to repent, to turn to God. It will look like a hundred others. But it is the last. And it's gone. It's the last church service. The last knock on the door. As the psalm we sung earlier instructs us. So teach us, Lord, the heavenly art of numbering our days, that wisdom may incline the heart to walk in all your ways. If we do not number our days, God will. Humble yourself. And the second challenge is this, it's urgency. Urgency. Our sole task as Christ church, is to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to call men and women, boys and girls, to repent and turn to Christ the Lord. And doesn't this passage press upon us the absolute urgency of that task? Because for some, it will be too late. Those are very chilling words, aren't they, in verse 30? That very night... That very night. So don't wait 
to humble yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait. That is both our message and our motivation. Don't wait. The hymn I quoted at the very beginning has this as its refrain. And we'll finish with this. Oh, come today. Do not delay. Too late, it soon will be. To Jesus fly. For mercy cry. He waits to welcome thee. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these chapters which speak of your absolute sovereignty, sovereignty in salvation, but also sovereignty in judgment. So Lord, help us to heed the warning. Help us to humble ourselves before you, the living God. Help us to humble ourselves all before it is too late. Help us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time by singing number 705, a hymn that speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one to whom we must submit, the one we must fling ourselves upon for grace and mercy. Rock of ages, cleft for me, hide me now, my refuge be. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side which flowed be for sin, the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Number 705.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen.